mum and dad immigrated uh, from Gidor. Six children in, in a one bedroom house in Ibrox. And I understand where a lot of families are. What gave a lot of people hope was that there was somebody there challenging them, echoing the words that they were screaming at the TV. But sometimes you can't hold it together for them. If this crisis that happened 10 years ago was to present itself today, the policy response would be what Sinn Féin articulated at that time. For 20 minutes solid, I've just been in tears. Some of the stuff that is happening out there is very, very cruel. And there is a full-blown cost of living crisis. Any fair-minded person would see clearly that there is a need to build houses. And we intend to create uh, a society where universal basic services are, are a right. I was born in Glasgow um, and my mum and dad immigrated uh, from Gidor uh, back in the 1960s like many other families where there was very little job opportunities and, and turned to Scotland for, for those opportunities and uh, my family were all born and uh, my brothers and sisters were all born in, in, in Glasgow uh, and we lived there, the, the six children and my mum and my dad in a, in a one bedroom house in Ibrox uh, and I was very young when we returned home, I'm the second youngest in the family and uh, one summer, just when my family came home as they would to visit their mums and dads and to, to visit the relatives during the summer, uh, an opportunity arose for them to return home. And in the early 80s, they, they came home. And I've been living in Gidor ever since. It's a, a beautiful area. It's a, a part of the, the Donegal Gaeltart. Um, it's an area where obviously Gaelic is the, the spoken language of, of the day, which was a bit of a challenge for us because we came home with all Scottish accents and uh, you can actually hear still the Scottish twang with it, my older brothers and sisters. It's an isolated community, the, the, probably the, it's one of the most densely populated areas and the most densely populated rural area in, in Europe. Um, and it's 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 something that you know I, I grew up by the sea, um, and I think there's something where when you grow up by the sea, it's very hard to actually leave that. Um, it's just it's 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 a very calming influence on you. You know when you're sitting down, or indeed when you're standing outside at night, and, and just listening on a silent night to the sea roar. So there's a, there's all of that experience, but it's you've you've not just got the sea, but you've got the islands that are right off the coast likes of Gold Island, which was deserted in the, the, the 1960s. Uh, you've got Tory Island, which is still trying to ensure that it's a, got a vibrant community on Iron Moor, and all of the other islands that are speckled off the, the Gidor coast. But on the other side of it then, you've got the mountain range, and you've got Aragal, uh, and you've got in between the lakes. And, and there's just something beautiful about that area, but also the fact that it's, it's steeped in culture, it's steeped in history, and it's very much where the language is, is, is very alive. And it's, you know, there's nowhere else that I want, would want to live and nowhere would I would want to bring up my children uh, that in that area because I think it's, 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 it's unique. But suppose everybody will say that about their own area, but I always think that, uh, you know, coming home from a, a long week in, in, in Dublin and sometimes you're coming around at midnight by by Dunlewy and even though you can't see the scenery, the beautiful scenery of the Poison Glen as it opens up to you after going through, you know, about 20 minutes of just, you know, uh, the Glen Bay National Park and when you see that Dunlewy Lake and the Poison Glen and the old chapel in Errigal on the right hand side, it doesn't fail just to put a smile on your, on your face. I do the, the, the runs, the football runs, the music runs, the basketball runs, we do all that, we try and share that as much as we can. If a, four young boys um, from six up to up to 12 and they keep myself and, and, and Roshan very busy um, look, and it's 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 always a challenge um, I'm here in Dublin quite a bit of the time when I'm back in Donegal I'm I'm, I'm out meeting constituents holding clinics and all the rest and it's always a, a challenge to to balance that role in terms of your responsibilities to the public and your responsibilities to your family and the fact that you want to spend more and more time with your family and, and, and all of that. And it's, um, it's, uh, it, it's, it's sometimes very challenging. Uh, I know um, people ask me sometimes, what, do you want, what did you want to be when you grew up? And my honest answer is the only thing I ever wanted to be when I grew up was a father. You know, my father was, was a great man. Unfortunately, he died six years ago and I really looked up to him and I really wanted to be like him. People loved him. He was great crack. He was a great Gaelic footballer. Um, 
and I always wanted to just be a, a, a good father. Um, and I'm, I'm blessed that I have uh, four young boys. And it's busy. It's busy, you know, and it's, it's, it's challenging juggling um, all of that. But it keeps you grounded, you know. Your kids keep you grounded. Uh, you might think that you've had a great day and all the rest, but as soon as you walk in the door, yeah. it's about daddy this or daddy that or when are we going to do this or when are we going to do that. And that's, that's good because you need that. You know, um, and that's what that's what kind of that's who I am. It's 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 what it's it's your experience. It's your past experience. It's your family experience. It's the experience of your your mom and dad. It's what shapes you in any society. It's the people that are around you that influence you, uh, and that help shape you. And that's the values that I bring to my job today as finance spokesperson for the lead opposition party. It's the values that I will bring to the job as Minister for Finance if I am in that position. Um, And I understand where a lot of families are. I understand sometimes how difficult life can be just to get by, just to deal with the things life throws at you and dealing with the fact that you don't have services that should be available to you is an obstacle that should never be thrown in your way. So it's it's good. It's all all boys. It's busy. It's... uh, it can keep you keep you on your toes. I was appointed um, finance spokesperson uh, for the party uh, just as the the troika had arrived, and uh, was thrown in thrown in, in the deep end. So and I've been there ever since. It, it was a it was a huge opportunity because, and I I got this from a lot of people during that period that despite the fact that the government was doing what it was doing, despite the pain and suffering that it was inflicting on ordinary people and, you know, the cuts that took place at that time that devastated people's lives, what gave a lot of people hope was that there was somebody there challenging them, echoing the words that they were screaming at the TV or screaming at the radio or, or, or speaking how they felt. And it's crucially important that even though you may not have convinced the government not to do what they have done, that you give voice to a a large section of public opinion. Um, And it was a privilege to do that during that period. It was very, very difficult because you also had situations that during that period that you weren't prepared for. You know, you go into politics, you go into activism to, to change people's lives for the better. But when you're sitting across the table in your clinic from sometimes maybe an elderly person who's gone through life, you know, who's seen, you know, all, all that life could throw at them and, and, and faced it all and, and gone through there and is breaking down in your clinic because the cupboards are bare, they have no food. Um, or when a mother's there and talking about a child with special needs or the need for an operation, they can't get it. And, you know, you're sometimes there's nearly a role of a, a counselling role there and... It's, it's you, you try to empathise and, 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 and hold it together for them, but sometimes you can't hold it together for them. And look, I've, I've been at meetings where for 20 minutes solid, I've just been in tears, like, and it's, you know, that's, and that's, that's just the way it is, like, you know, and it's some, some of the stuff that is happening out there is very, very cruel. And um, so it was, it was a, it was a huge opportunity to represent those, to give voice to, to, to those opinions. And unfortunately, the arguments that we argued at the time, for example, in terms of what the government did by putting our money into bailing out bus banks, it's now proven correct. It is now standard policy right across Europe. If this crisis that happened 10 years ago was to present itself today, what the policy response would be what Sinn Féin articulated at that time, that we should burn the bondholders. It is now accepted, but at that time, uh, we were ridiculed by the establishment class, um, and you know. I did the closing pitch, and I thought it was excellent. Sorry, I think it's been just a quick review of the two days. I think they were very worthwhile. I thought that economic piece with the two lads in was useful. So when it comes to it, Pierce, what are our priorities? Our priority has to be about making life more affordable for the many, not luxurious for the few. It's wrong that the top 10% have a third of all income generated, and we need to rebalance that in favour of the 90%, putting more money into their pockets and reducing their cost of living. There is a full-blown cost of living crisis, and there's hundreds of thousands of people out there who are just about getting by. They're able to make their budget balance at the end of the month. But God help them, and this is what they worry about, if the car breaks down 
or if something goes in the house, the washing machine breaks down, or if an unexpected bill goes that a relative dies and they have to travel abroad to a funeral or so on. It's just how do we cope with those problems? And we need to ensure that that's not the way that these people should have to go through life. We need to ensure that they can build up their own rainy day fund, their own little nest, to make sure that they can save for the future uh, and that any of these uh, unplanned events uh, aren't uh, a major financial worry that can tip these families over the edge. And that's why dealing with the cost of living crisis and making sure that we give something back to those families would be a key priority for me as Minister for Finance. So every year, we bring forward, a, bring together a team of experts, social and economic experts that look at our alternative budget, our policies. We look at what has happened in the last year. We look at where the needs of society are. We look at all of the, 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 the resources that are available to us. We need to ensure that the budget balances. We need to ensure that we meet our international commitments. But primarily what we need to do is we need to ensure that we address the social needs of citizens right across the island of Ireland. And we don't begin that work a couple of weeks out from budget. We begin that a couple of weeks after the last budget. Uh, and we, we talk to the experts, we deal with the Irish Fiscal Advisory Council, we get all of the advice and we pull it all together. And we get it costed by the Department of Finance and the Department of Public Expenditure. So accusations like we're economic illiterates or that it doesn't add up is, is just a throwaway remark from the opposition to try and stunt the political debate in, 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 in this jurisdiction. And the reason they don't want this debate is because any fair-minded person would see clearly that there is a need to build houses to bring our children out of emergency accommodation instead of cutting taxes for the wealthies in society. Any fair-minded person would say that there is a need to open the 600 beds that were closed by Fianna Fáil and Fianna Gael in our hospitals so that we can treat those who are lying on hospital trolleys, hundreds every single day, and the thousands that are waiting on waiting lists, instead of giving banks tax breaks, where despite the fact that the three banks are making 2.5 billion euro in profits every year, they don't pay any corporation tax and some of them won't pay for the next 20 years. And that's the debate that they don't want to have. What the budget needs to be is not about a battle about the maths of the budget, because the government's budget will add up and our budget will add up. It needs to be about what underpins both of those budgets, what underpins, what values uh, are at the foundation of those. And that is where the debate is. It is about what direction do we want Irish society to travel in? Do we want more of the same? where we will tinker along the edges. Yes, where you might get an increase in public services, an extra few guards, an extra few public sector workers here, a little tax cut here and there from what Fianna Fáil and Fianna Gael will co cobble together. Or do you want to just stop and take a, take a moment and say, no, society is organised in the wrong way. We should not have a housing crisis and we're never going to have one ever again. What is happening with our children in emergency accommodation is moral. It is a scandal that we will look back in 20 years with shame. What is happening in our hospitals is outrageous. In a country that has the wealth that it does, it is just not shared properly and it is not allocated properly. And that isn't the fault of citizens. That is the fault of politicians who on budget day decide that the resources created by the Irish people are going to be allocated in this way. So. We believe that there is a new economic debate that needs to take place, and that's the debate that we have started. We intend to lead that debate, and we intend to win that debate, and we intend to create uh, a society where universal basic services are, are a right, something that is available in many countries throughout Europe, where we don't have the top 1% in higher society having 11% of all income or the top 10% having a third of all income, while at the same time we have 155,000 people on the minimum wage. We need to ensure that prosperity is shared in Ireland. We need to ensure that we don't just rely on foreign direct investment, that none of us can be sure that we'll be here in the future, but we need to build our indigenous sector. Every week when I'm going to work in Dublin, I have to cross the border twice. There's the message now from my 
phone provider telling me that I'm officially abroad and how much data I can use. And this border that we're just crossing is one of the main reasons, if not the main reason, why we see so much disadvantage in this region. Donegal, West Tyrone, high levels of unemployment, high levels of deprivation, and that's replicated right across the border because it stunts our economic potential. It, it stunts uh, the type of development that we need to have here. Look, Brexit isn't just going to have implications for my county in the northwest, or indeed the border counties, is going to have implications right across the island of Ireland, and those implications are, are going to be dire. There, there's no doubt about it that counties such as my own in Donegal are going to feel the hardest hit as a result of Brexit because we are cut off from the rest of the 26 counties as a result of the border. And, and what we in Sinn Féin are insisting on is that we need a solution to the Irish border. And the only solution in, in that case, in the context of Brexit, is for the North to remain within the EU and given special status. And that's what the people of the, the North argued for. But that alone won't address the imbalances that we see in the border region. That's why the debate about Irish unity needs to take, go to another level. That we are moving, in my view, to a position where we will have a border poll, where the majority of people will vote for Irish unity. And that will come about because of demographic changes. It will become about because Sinn Féin is agitating for it. And other people are recognising that it is in their interest uh, that we have an end to the, the Irish border. People are seeing from a business point of view, from a sporting point of view, from a social point of view, from an agricultural point of view, that the border is an impediment, even as it is without Brexit. Brexit in itself brings that, has amplified that debate in, in, in a huge way. For me to the, the islands are, are, are very important. You know, there, there's something about the sea and the islands, but particularly the likes of Goal Island because it was deserted. Because on either side of it, I can see Iron Moor and you can see the Tory Light, you can't see Tory, but you can see the Tory Lighthouse shining at night time. And both of those islands still have people living on them permanently, but Goal it doesn't. And every time I sit down at my dinner table, that's the view I have. I have Goal Island. But it's also very symbolic because that can happen to a lot of communities. If you don't provide the services, if you don't provide the opportunities, you get people that were forced to leave the island. And you can see the same stuff happening in, 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 in rural Ireland, in the west coast of Ireland, where you have depopulation to the largest centres, which that itself creates pressure on the larger centres. Like the, the fact that we have 40% of our population living in Dublin is way out of line with any other European capital, and that creates pressures in terms of housing, in terms of congestion. But it's the, 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 the lack of vision to have a proper regional balanced development plan. And, and, and Goal Island to me is, 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 is very important because when we were living in Glasgow and all my cousins would come home in the summer, and all of them, the families would all come home on the first day that the school ended. And they would spend nearly eight weeks at home uh, in Gidor. Um, and all of the cousins would be running around together. And there was about 20 of us, uh, all we Scotties. And at the end of the summer, what marked the end of the summer is my uncle, a fisherman, would take us out in a boat to Gola Island. And we would spend a day in Gola Island. And that was known that it, things were coming to an end. So always had that huge attraction to me, but the, the, the people, the island people are very resilient. And you can see that in Tory, you can see that in Aaron Moore, you can see the challenges that fa they faced, but they faced them. But at the end of the day, it was decisions to not keep a school opened that ended their way of life. And you talk to anybody from the island, no matter what, even people who have left the island 40, 50 years, they're always an island man or woman. And that's home, you know, in Yelene Chinchan or the Hinchan Hain, that's their home. And our job is to provide people those opportunities so that they can live at home, so that they can work at home, so that they can raise their family at home, so that they can get through life and reach their opportunities and reach their potential at home if that's what they wish.